T-minus three, two, one, zero. Hello, everybody. Welcome to another episode of the Launch Sequence Podcast. My name is Space Tomato, and I'm here with a special guest today, Ferrister, another YouTuber of Star Citizen for episode 71. How are you doing, my friend? I'm well, thank you. Thank you for inviting me. I think this should be an interesting topic to discuss. Yeah, this is going to be a good one. Today we are talking about CitizenCon coming up. It's about a week away from it at the time of recording. We're also going to talk about 318, the next major update coming to Star Citizen. Not quite 4.0, but preparing for it, and it's bringing a couple of interesting things itself. So I am ready for a good old, good old fashioned Star Citizen theory crafting and copium discussion. Um, how has the game been treating you lately, though? Have you been playing? You've been getting to get into the game or mostly just covering the content? No, I've been getting into the game. I've probably been spending a lot of time just doing the the gameplay loops that are in there to make money. Um, one of the big things I'm working on at the moment is trying to do more ship reviews. And to do that, I need the funds. So I've been running uh, box delivery contracts, cargo, mining, the whole lot, and just enjoying playing the game as a game rather than as a development item. That's nice. I don't ever do that, really. And you are, uh, you put in more effort than I do. When I want to do a ship review, I'm like, hey, can I borrow a ship from somebody? <laughs> I never actually make any money. Um, real quick, before we keep going, I'd like to let everybody who's listening or watching know you might hear some construction noises in the background. They decided they wanted to, I don't know, expand this mosque outside the window or something. So they're just like drilling into the ground. Sorry about that if you hear that. Just think of it as immersion. We're sitting in Hurston as they expand the new neighborhoods in the in the city makeover that they're doing. I don't know. We'll fit it in somehow like that. Anyways, so you've been playing the game. Uh, 317 has been a long branch. We got the first version of 317, I think, in March or April. And it's been about five to six months now between 17, 317.1 and 317.2. Have you been noticing any improvements throughout the year in this patch cycle? Has it been getting any better or worse for you in terms of performance? I think it's much of a muchness for me. Um, I think we will see more and more of these longer branches as you know development continues because in the nicest way, a lot of the easy things to implement have been implemented and now they're at the more difficult things. Um, but we have seen some quite significant changes this year as well. You know, it was this year that we saw the big gatherings of 100 players getting together as the server size increase. Um, and so in the context of, you know, much, much larger servers, I think it's easy to forget some of those progress items as well. Yeah, yeah. And that's a good point. It'd be interesting. Uh, I know a lot of people were saying um, when Chris put out his letter from the chairman earlier this year and they talked about the extended ptu they wanted to do for persistent entity streaming coming in a lot of people sounded actually pretty interested in the idea of just always keeping the ptu running with the new stuff and then always having that live update kind of over the top so that we could see these longer patch cycles like that i like i like that you, you think that might be where they're headed with this kind of stuff it will be interesting to see. I mean, many other games out there do have exactly that. They've got a what they call a stable branch. I don't know if Star Citizen would dare release something that they called a stable branch. <laughs> um, and then they've got kind of a release or a development branch or a, a PTU type thing. Um, you know, it's a possibility. I guess that the only difference that we've got with Star Citizen is we've not got to the point yet where they've released what they'd call a released product or a right. final product or, or a final game and so you know i think to say we've got the the development branch we've also got another development branch which is slightly less stable i don't know how they'd do it but yeah yeah it's like the whole of the game is a unstable development branch we'll call it stable ish but i i almost dare not even talk about it but by the time this game goes quote unquote live you do you imagine that they would still have a kind of development branch that people could play maybe for like the new star systems or something that are coming in? Or would that be too much spoiler territory? CIG is very, very crazy about their spoilers. I can I can see things like that happening. Um, 
I mean, they run the risk of spoiler territory now, right? They run the risk of that. They start with the Eva Carti, then they roll out to other people. Um, people know what's coming in the patches anyway because people yeah. interrogate the game files. So mm -hmm. I think the spoiler territory is limited. I could definitely see value in testing. And ultimately, when we've got a quote-unquote live game balancing things as before they released. So I could see a role for it. Yeah, it definitely would be... I think it would be less of a thing then because right now we're just starved for information and gameplay and stuff. So I, I could see it not being as, uh, as risky at that time, but they're, they're always, you know, run that risk of the spoilers. It's a good point. So let's talk about Citizen Con. It's, uh, this is actually going to be their ninth Citizen Con, I believe, uh, if you count 2020 and the 10th anniversary of the Kickstarter, right? Yeah. Because they ran the Kickstarter in 2013, so we are, it's been a long time. Um, people, people sometimes say it's a little bit weird that they've been running this convention every year for a game that, I mean, even in like 2014, there was no game, like you couldn't do anything. And even now, uh, it's still definitely a game clearly in development that is far off from being released. Um, do you think it's weird that they do that? Do you think that there's a necessity for Citizen Con? What's your take? Yeah, I mean, I, 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 firstly, I think it's a very interesting choice of name, Citizen Con, for a game that is often associated or <laughs> accused of being a scam. Um, for me, the, the things that have conventions, things that have cons, are as much about hype as anything else, right? When you look at other conventions in other, you know, other games or other genres, it's all about hyping things up. And Star Citizen has hype. It has always had a lot of hype around it for various reasons. Uh, that's not to say that that hype is universal. There are some people that are less excited or their excitement has waned. But in terms of capturing that hype, I think, you know, that's great. Uh, Citizen Con is often also a good way for them to ramp up sales for things. So I'm sure from a business standpoint, it's it's great. Um, ultimately, if people watch it, um, it's worth doing. So I think the proof of the pudding for me is whether people watch it and enjoy it and take a lot away from it. Yeah, I I think I'm I'm in the same boat as you. I've always seen it as a hype event. I feel like in, the, in recent years, they've gotten a lot better at focusing on it being like an actual source of information rather than just sort of a celebration, you know, a marketing kind of thing. Uh, and, and I've been enjoying that. But you also, you make a good point. If somebody's watching it, just keep doing it. Um, and hopefully that is a something that they remember after I think it was 2018 maybe when they tried to charge money for the additional content that they were bringing in that was like a yeah people are watching it but i don't i don't think they're gonna pay for it that was an yeah, oof was, moment yeah but but thankfully they realized that this was when they wanted to make citizen con pay per view right. um, they realized before the event that was a non-starter um and so very quickly reversed that decision but hmm a good call, a good call on their end, but uh, not a good call to ever make that an option. I think that was uh, definitely a miscalculation. How many Citizen Cons have you seen? Uh, I backed uh, August 2014, and I've I've tuned into every Citizen Con since mm. then. And I was I was fortunate enough to travel in 2015 to the in person Citizen Con in Manchester as well. Oh, that's cool. I've still not been to one in person. I actually didn't start looking into them really until like 2017, I think it was. I remember I remember seeing the trailer that came out at the end of the 2015 one with the infamous answer the call. Uh, I think that was like the first times I started to pay more attention. And then 2016, I didn't pay attention. But 2017, I, I remember being pretty impressed because they were showing like Planet Tech. They showed the Idris landing on the moon and everything. And I was like, OK, I'm going to start watching this more. And I, I think they got more interesting since then. Do you have a, a favorite year or do you feel like they've gotten better since then? I actually I don't think they've got better since then. Mm. Um, I, I, I understand the rationale why. So, so my, my take on this is in the early years of the Citizen Con experience, they would always have, I think they used to call it a keynote, 
right? Mm -hmm. Where they showed something that was designed to make you go, wow, this game could be incredible. Right. Um, So I remember, you know, I think 2014, it was first view of the persistent universe. Um, And then the one I went to in Manchester, it was the the Morrow tour of the Idris, which was, wow, this is huge. Um, The first view of multi-crew where people were on the same constellation, incredible. Um, There was the elusive sandworm um that they got plenty of feedback around uh, um, feedback <laughs> and then like yeah and then like you say you know showing off things like procedural cities or lawville or this is a brand new location it was 2019 we saw the jump point to pyro with the carrick going through the wormhole yeah. um the, the challenge with all of these things has been that they show this stuff and it does wow us right i was wowed at every single one of those it it absolutely hit the mark for that but it's not gameplay I have in my hands now for the most part. Mm -hmm. And I think they soon realized that, you know, it's great to show this stuff to showcase what the game could be in the future, but they've got another citizen con next year. And quite rightly, if, you know, those things that they show at citizen con aren't delivered within the year, people will start asking questions to say, well, you know, this looked incredible, but where's my sandworm? Um, And so I think of, of recent years, they've recognized that. And so they've pivoted slightly. One of the things that always happened at the Citizen Cons was the various kind of um, technical demonstrations or the you know the talks by members of the team. Um, they are very, very interesting to watch and to listen to and to hear what people have been working on, but they have slightly less excitement about them than kind of the big keynote, look at this, this is amazing. Yeah. Um, And so I think that has taken some of the hype out of the Citizen Cons for me. I can understand why it makes sense, because I'd rather, you know, not be disappointed by something I'm not going to get. But that does reduce the hype somewhat, I think. Yeah, yeah. I I honestly feel like the reduced hype is better. (laughs) I um. I, w- I prefer the event being very information dense and less kind of showy. I appreciated that last year's was basically just a single scenario played out in a couple different ways, all very compact. You know, they weren't like going to different planets. They weren't looking at fauna or going on massive adventures. They were just centralized around this single outpost. I think that was a pretty good demo outside of the fact that that outpost's and the pyro system in general didn't make it since then but we saw a lot of very realistic stuff the inventory system looting interactions ai navigating on the planet all things that i think made a significant difference in the game between that convention and this one and i do hope i mean there's no keynote this year but i do hope the stuff that they're showing us this year is in the same vein stuff that we can expect to see in the next few patches um were there any, besides like the hyped keynote last year, were there any major panels that you really felt hit the nail or hit the nail, hit the nail on the head? Yeah, that one. Uh, it's a difficult question because I think if if the con is, if the convention is all about generating hype, then I don't think so. I think there was, my perspective certainly was, I think there was a quite muted reaction amongst the Star Citizen community about CitizenCon last year. Yeah. Um, Now, that's not to say the panels weren't interesting. I found the panels very interesting as somebody who's kind of interested in Star Citizen and the development of Star Citizen. But I think some of the complicated conversations going on became a bit of a meme because I think people were tuning in to see what's the shiny, what's the exciting, show me something new, show me something that we'll get. And I feel like that was missing a little bit Mm -hmm. last year. Um, And to be fair, this year, again, for understandable reasons, feels like it's more in the same vein. So I think a lot of people will tune in for a couple of the panels, but I don't know how many will tune in for all of them. Right. Do you think this is going to be a two-part question? First, do you think that they're doing less shiny show stuff because they feel like now the game itself is showing more shiny show stuff and ISC that the content we get throughout the year feels a little more substantial so they don't have to hype it up as much and do you think it's better for the image of star citizen that they're toning back the hype um yes and yes so i i I think primarily the reason why they're showing less of the shiny stuff is because number one they've been burned by it in the past okay it was 
it was three years ago that we saw, here's the jump point to Pyro, and we were all excited for Pyro. And there were videos on YouTube saying, oh, we're going to get Pyro tomorrow. It's going to be incredible. Uh, here we are three years on from that CitizenCon. We don't have that gameplay yet. So I think they've been burned by it in the past, and they're probably mindful of, you know, they've got a lot more people following the project. And as time goes on, there's much more of a risk of losing some of that interest. You know, um, I see more and more people who've been backing the game for years and years and years who say, oh, I'm just going to tune in this year and see what's new. And then I'll tune out again until later on. Yeah. So I think by by avoiding running too much of the Big Bang stuff, they're trying to avoid saying, you know, people saying, where's my sandworm? It's been <laughs> it's been years. Um, but also, I think they're also at the stage where more of the hurdles are back-end technology hurdles that, frankly, most gamers aren't interested in. Um, I find them quite interesting because it's interesting to see more about the development. Yeah. But most people just want to play the game, right? So they don't care about persistent entity streaming that much. Um, so, yeah, I can leave my coffee cup on a moon. Great, but <laughs> I'm not going to do that. So it, how does it affect my mining or how does it affect my combat or you know, how does it affect the gameplay? Um, I think despite the fact that some of those are very, very technical challenges that need to be overcome to deliver the game. So I think um, they're probably focusing much more on what's actually going to be delivered in the short term, explaining some of those technicals um, because they need to be in place as stepping stones to the wider PE. I always find it funny that Chris uses the coffee cup example for entities or for persistence when he could probably pick something that more players, like you said, would would uh, relate to. You know, it's uh, talking about a, a secret stash of weapons or something, but it's always the coffee cup in the forest, and that gives me a chuckle every time. Yeah. Um. So you mentioned that this this year's uh, convention is a little more toned down, kind of like last year. It's just focusing on the panels. In fact, they completely said uh, no keynote this year, no big demo. Are there any of the panels this year, though, that are particularly standing out to you? Oh, yes, actually. Um, I think the very first panel where we potentially see Pyro, they talk about it being an in-engine tour. That, for me, is very exciting. Um, you know, I mentioned 2019, there was a lot of excitement around Pyro. It feels like we're close now, um, but actually seeing some of what we're going to get through Pyro, I think could be very interesting. Um, we know that, you know, there's more planets than there are in Stanton. It's a bigger system than Sad Stanton. Uh, so I think starting to get a sneak peek of some of that and seeing it in engine will give a lot of people the reassurance that actually Pyro is close. So once these technical issues are solved, you know, there's nothing to say that we couldn't see Pyro. Yeah. So that first panel, I think, will be great. I'm wondering um, when they say in engine, I'm wondering if they are going to like take a camera and just fly around the area or if they're actually going to plop a player down, like a, a character down on these planets and walk around and show us. Because they've in engine and in game has to me different, different ideas. And I feel like they chose that, uh, that terminology particularly. Yeah, I mean to be to be honest, I'm pretty cool with either. Um, I think the the in game is more the stuff about you know making the jump points work, making the server technology work, rather than you know they could replace Stanton with Pyro tomorrow if all of the systems were built out. It's fair. It's more how do you get Stanton and Pyro to run side by side that I think is the hurdle. So what I'm really looking for is well, the explorer in me is just excited to see some different places in Star Citizen, but also I'm just it will give me the reassurance that Pyro is pretty much ready once that technology is online, um, which just means that those stepping stones are what's stopping us. Um, and as soon as they're resolved, we'll potentially get Pyro. So that's why I'm quite interested in that session. It's interesting you say that because it does feel like over the last two years, I would say now, when they first talked about Pyro, like you said, during CitizenCon 2019, they just barely, it wasn't even the system, probably just some kind of a play space they generated. It had the feeling to me like it was just an expansion of the game they could just shift everything from stanton into that system but from what we've seen from the things they talk about with ai um these shanty towns floating in space uh the different territories of the gangs and the size and scope of the system it feels like they're almost trying to differentiate it from stanton in that it is a true expansion to the game and not just a new play space 
Are you getting that same kind of vibe or do you think it'll just be another star system in Star Citizen? I, I hope that's the vibe that we get. Um, I, I, I don't know is the long and short of it. I think we'll need to have more information. But to, I think to your point, I was, I was watching Salty Mike this week on his stream. I hate to name drop all the other creators. Watch Space Tomato as well. But Salty we've, Mike we've, was streaming. We've had Salty Mike on here. Check out the episode if you haven't. <laughs> Um, and he, he was talking about actually one of the things that would be good to see is an interplay between the two systems to encourage people to move between them. So, for example, he said, you know, it'd be great if you could uh, mine Quantanium in Stanton, but you could only sell it in Pyro and vice versa. There might be something in Pyro that you can trade for that sells for a huge amount in Stanton yeah. So to encourage people to move between them. I think that would be good. Um, I think some of the other things that we might see in conjunction with having a new system online and some of the things that they're doing around, you know, for example, the cargo refactor, potentially it creates different types of missions so for example you know we've got trading in the game but suddenly if if trading from planet to station looks different from trading from station to station or from system to system you know there's more flavors of some of the existing gameplay loops i use trading there as an example but maybe it's the same for combat you know maybe the types of encounters that you find from a combat perspective in Stanton are a little bit more tame than what you find in Pyro, where it's much more high tempo. And again, you know, that encourages people to do things differently. If you want a, an easier fight, you fight in Stanton. If you want to challenge yourself more, you go to Pyro and you go up against the best. So I'd rather see things like that that put a different flavor on some of the gameplay loops that we've got at the moment because that opens up more possibilities yeah i do wish that we had got we we could get more discussion this might be something they talk about in inside star citizen next year of how thematically different they're going to make the different situations in either system i know um pedro camacho the the composer of star citizen in in most aspects i think most of the music in the game has come from him uh, has talked about how the music will be different. And I know that makes a huge difference. So I'm excited to see how much they can really double down on that. And as the game continues to expand, how much you will notice that you are in a different system, you're in a different kind of play space than you were in other systems. It's, it's cool that we finally are getting a second system to start to explore those types of things. Exactly. And that's why I'm really interested in that panel. I think it will give a good flavor for what, what to expect and set the tone. It'll be interesting in to see. Of, oh, go ahead. Oh, I was going to just talk about some of the other panels, but you go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say it. It'll be interesting to see how much detail they put into that while they're doing the, uh, the, the tour. But please, yes, tell us what, what is another panel that you're looking at? <laughs> um, th there's a couple that, that I would watch purely because i'm interested in someone or something so the second panel is all about uh, an investigation mission type which reading between the lines is a way to offer better story content for players driven by that i'm not hugely bothered by that other than the fact that it's luke presley who's presenting it and yeah. i always think that luke's got interesting things to say so i'll i'll watch it purely for that reason and then likewise i think it's panel number six, where they talk about resource management and power. Um, I'm interested in that for a couple of reasons. The first is they talk about how that pertains to homesteading, and I didn't understand that. So I was like, oh, I'm going to have to watch that to figure out how they're linked, um, but also how that pertains to multi-crew. And you know, people who watch my videos on YouTube will know I'm very excited for multi-crew in this game. So um, more meaningful multi-crew multi gameplay, that sounds incredible, and I'm, I'm definitely going to tune in for that one. Yeah, it's it's funny that both of those are in the same panel, because I would say of the last three years, two of the longest term features, most consistent features that have been coming up, but still not in the game were the resource management that we saw Dan Truffin start talking about, I think, in 2020 and um, these new colonialism outposts, which I think they only introduced a few months earlier than that. Now they're both kind of coming together at the same time to introduce some very exciting new gameplay. Like you said, this is really where multi-crew starts and uh, the type of ship that you pick really starts to matter. And I think that's really cool. Definitely. And, and I'm, I'm very excited for that, for the multi-crew. 
Having said all of that, I think um, other than perhaps maybe Pyro, the panel that most people will tune in for will be ships. I'm just as interested in everybody else to see what's on that panel as well. As much as we all complain and say, stop buying new ships, I'm always interested when they come out. I think there's some interesting work that goes on. And again, the team that are down to present that panel, I think their work has always been great. So um, I'll be interested to see that. I'm really excited to see how they change that panel. It's a very consistent one. They've been doing it every year for the last three or four years, I think. And it's always interesting to see the little subtle differences that they make based on, I, I'm assuming, feedback from the previous year. So it, they're big names, Ben Curtis, John Crew, Paul Jones. Uh, all three are very long-term people we've been seeing in Star Citizen for a while. So I'm excited to see what they bring with that one, that one as well. Definitely, definitely agree. Now, that panel, the ship panel, is the only of all of them that don't have the sort of subtitle Journey to 4.0. And there have been different kind of, I mean, I've gotten different responses when I'm talking about that as to what that could mean. But when I read that, I take that to mean, hey, this is something that we're going to be introducing into the game in 4.0. Is that how you take it or do you see them as just kind of trying to slip 4.0 in there and be like, some of this will be in 4.0 and maybe some of it won't? Yeah, I, I think my take on it is that 4.0 is sufficiently close to say it's around the corner and sufficiently far enough away to say, and if this stuff doesn't make it, it's because it's still too far in the future and we're guessing. So I think it's just kind of the next milestone that feels tangible but also gives them the license to say you know we showed you this but it didn't make it because do you think they might have shot themselves in the foot by putting that in there no i don't think so um i feel like it's all close enough and tangible enough to be okay um the real question is, are we going to get 4.0 when Chris originally hoped that we <laughs> might? Uh, <laughs> I, I don't think so, personally. I think that next summer is like the earliest that we might see it. it. It just, there's so much, you know, and especially if they're talking about some of these things. Like I said, I, I take this to mean that they want to include these in 4.0. And just looking at all the content and the different things from server meshing to power management, um, to a whole new star system. It's a lot in one patch. So I could see it sitting in PTU for quite a while. I, I agree on both counts. I, I think realistically 4.0 is probably middle of next year um, at the best. And I think some of this stuff might not make it. Um, I really hope it all does. I think they're planning for it to all make it into 4.0. But as ever with some of these things, as soon as you start getting really into the development, you can get caught out by something you weren't expecting and then suddenly it's delayed. So I think the wording of it is careful to say, this is our ambition. We're hoping to get this into 4.0 and we're hoping 4.0 will be soon ish. Mm -hmm. um, but, but if we don't make it, you know, it was an aspiration. It wasn't a promise. I do hope they clarify during citizen con. I would, I gosh, I would love to know that resource management's coming in 4.0. That makes so much of a difference because 4.0 with Pyro is also going to require us to start using bigger ships, right? The, the, the light fighters won't be able to get around Pyro as easily. So you start seeing people group, group up into these ships or these convoys flying into that system together. To know that um, power management or resource management would be a thing at that same time would be a, just a drastic change from how we're playing the game now. I would, I would love it. The, the challenge with things like that is how do you... How do you make it work on a small fighter in such a way that one person who's trying to do everything yeah. can still optimize? And how do you make it worthwhile a person doing that on a huge ship like a Carrick? And that is gameplay in itself. That's yeah. the challenge that they've got to, to address. But to be fair, I think that's that's the sort of min-maxing that people are interested in anyway. Mm -hmm. You know, as a multi-crew person, I would love to be able to learn to do that on a big ship like a Carrick. Um, equally, you know, for the for the absolute, the, what is it, the top 1% we call them, of the, the top combat pilots who kind of know where to put their power, you know, that will give them an edge, but everybody doesn't have to do it. So if you're just starting the game, don't worry about it. Leave it all on default. You'll be fine. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's crucial. Like they have to make it so that people don't feel like they need to do that or else that just, that makes the new player experience feel so cumbersome. Um, 
especially in a single seat fighter, I have never felt comfortable kind of playing with my, so uh, the power triangle, for instance, is one thing, or maybe your heat and your um, power settings for some of your other components and that kind of stuff. I've never felt super comfortable interacting with the MFDs or the in-ship UI. And I, I hope that's something that they um, improve with these new MFDs coming up, but I don't, do you play a lot of these sort of flight sims or games where you would have to interact with your ship like that? Yeah, I, I absolutely do. In fact, of, of late, I've been watching a lot of Moist Noodle, who's been getting back into DCS World, yeah, and I yeah. love DCS World for that reason. You know, you've got the intricate control of the systems. What, what I would say for Star Citizen is that there are different ways of doing that. So you hear people using like voice attack and things like that to mm -hmm. move their power and adjust their power triangles, or some people have you know specific bespoke. Um, we'll call them iPad apps uh, that help to do that for them. I think all of that stuff is great. Um, but I think the thing that will make it interesting for me is if it matters more for some ships than others. So for example, if you're flying your Eclipse or your Hornet Ghost, which I've been flying a bit of lately, that might be really, really important. The stealth gameplay is so important in those ships that you have to make sure you're on top of your, you know, your power triangles, your heat signatures, things like that, mm -hmm. because that is the stealth profile of the ship. For me, that's a more interesting dynamic. Whereas if you want to just fly and don't care about it and just shoot things, you just play your regular Hornet and you don't worry about it. Mm -hmm. um, for me, that creates more variety and more reason to get into that stuff if you want to but not to penalize you too much if you don't want to get into that level of detail. It's a lot of balance that they're going to have to do for this. Yep. Wow. <laughs> yep. Is there anything in this CitizenCon, uh, a, a panel per se, or maybe a feature or a pillar of tech that they've talked about in the past that they're not talking about this year you wish they would bring up? That's a very good question. I think for me, it's not necessarily a panel or something that they've promised that I'm like them to talk about. I mean, the big gap for me is Squadron 42. Um, I would love to see some sort of update around Squadron 42 in there. Um, I'm quite surprised there isn't one. But the thing that's missing for me this year is in previous citizen cons, and you might know this as somebody who's kind of been a content creator and around for a bit, they've often asked for community involvement in things. They've mm -hmm. often run community competitions ahead of citizen con, you know, whether it's like, I remember making a video for citizen con, you know, a little 30 second clip to be shown during the intermissions. Yeah. And there were some great community submissions for that. There were other things, you know, they did cosplay competitions or, you know, some people designing things and, I've not seen any of that this year. And for me, one of the big draws about CitizenCon has always been the community involvement and celebrating the stuff that the community has been up to. I don't see any of that on the schedule. So that, I, I noticed that as well. And I took that to be them kind of almost taking a break from the more extraneous parts of citizen con to focus so much on just getting the bits and bones that are important and not distracting the devs any more than that but i i also it is kind of interesting um last year was the first time they did a digital one and they purposefully came out and said hey you know what you guys aren't here but we're still going to make sure the community's involved with like you said those pictures because before they would do um the uh the, the the cosplays they would sometimes even have like live gameplay i remember i think it was 2017 when they actually had the patch 3.0 available for people to play at citizen con that wasn't available to other people at that time so yeah they've they've definitely focused on that kind of stuff but it feels like they are putting that on the back burner until they can get physical again it does seem that way, and uh, that's that's the one thing that I'm quite surprised there isn't more of in the Citizen Con because mm -hmm. they've always said they're all about community. Well, we still got at least as of this recording a week to go before the event. I I do see them probably announcing a couple extra things that are going on, maybe uh, during, after, or leading up to, but they're probably just giveaways or or maybe some little things like that. It's a good point though. It, it's definitely noticeable the less community involvement this year. Um, I think for myself, I really wish that we would get another update on Quantum, the economy simulator. 
Because as much as we know where they want to go with it, outside of what they added, I think, in 317 with um, fuel rearming and repairing being kind of linked into the price changes of the economy system, we haven't gotten any major updates or understanding of where they are with that system. And I think that's a pretty important part of the game that they should be including in CitizenCon. I, I agree. I'm also conscious that last time Tony Z had a long session and the overwhelming feedback from people that watched it was, that sounds crazy, I don't understand it. And it needs people <laughs> like you to translate it into normal speak for people like me to be able to understand. So, you know, I, I agree with you. I think from somebody that's very, very detailed in their following of the game, that stuff is really important. But it might be just that they were responding to feedback from last time, which is a lot of those systems are very complicated to explain. And for 90% of players, it's probably... It's probably over our heads. It's, it's certainly over my head. I had to watch that a couple of times to try and make heads or tails of it. Oh my gosh. Last year, what it was for me was the Gen 12 panel. I watched that probably six or seven times to try and understand what they were talking about. Um, but yeah, I, I see where you're coming from. Sounds like a great opportunity for them to do some kind of an in-engine demo where they just show a couple of trades or something. But I can understand if that they don't want to put in the effort beforehand, distracting the team and putting that all together just to show it off. It's a good point. One other thing I and, would... And I think that the Sorry. quantum piece, it, it might be a case of the 90 and the 10, because I feel like the people who really follow Star Citizen development will be very, very interested in those panels and probably got a lot from every time Tony Z talks because he's a very smart guy and, and knows what he's talking about. But probably the 90% of people would just rather see such shiny ships. Just show, show me the ships, right? And, and show me what's coming. Um, so it's probably a tough balance to strike. Yeah, it, it probably is. I, I mean, I've... I've already said it multiple times in this in this talk. I really do hope that CitizenCon continues to be sort of a here are the nuts and bolts of the year kind of thing and save the shiny stuff for inside Star Citizen, or at least for the keynote, which they're not doing this year. Um, the other thing I really would hope we would hear about was reputation, because that's another important part of the pyro system in 4.0 in general, I think. And we haven't gotten an update on that either since earlier this year. Uh, and they were just kind of showing, I think, updated reputation markers for, for potential career paths. We don't really know where that system is headed right now, though. It's a good point. And, and actually, a lot of these systems solve problems that we see at the moment. So, for example, I, I know this because I've been burned by it this year. If you go on Reddit and say, should Star Citizen have PvP or PvE servers, oh, you will boy. get very, very passionate people on either side of that. Yeah. The reason why people are so passionate is because at the moment, we don't have the systems in place to deal with that. And the systems that we need in place are things like the reputation system, more systems online like Pyro, and you know all of these things actually help to solve problems that people are facing in-game at the moment. And yeah, I, I agree. It seems that we've not heard much around it. Yeah. And that's interesting too, because like you said, that's a very important topic. A lot of people are constantly talking about PVP, what, what constitutes griefing, what is piracy, how do I know if I'm in trouble, how do I know if I can go here? All of that depends on the reputation system. And it'd be nice for us to have easy, communicatable information about what we can expect within, say, the next six to 12 months. But maybe they don't think there is anything, which kind of worries me because pyros, like I said, it's going to depend on that, right? Or, or is it just a challenge that they've been burned so many times by saying this is what you can expect in the next six to nine to 12 well, months? Yeah. Not being able to deliver it and then people giving them a hard time for it. There is that, but then they go and they put Journey to 4.0 on the front of all of these panels. So <laughs> yeah. I, I don't know. I don't know. It's that's where we're going, not when we'll get there. Right. That's fair. Um, do you, you, you mentioned Squadron. That's something that you would want to see mentioned at Citizen Con, or do you, do you think that they should just shut up about that till it's ready? I, I, I want to hear about Squadron all the time. Um, for, for the first part, because I'm actually interested in Squadron. I would love to play it. I think it's going to be an interesting game. I know you, you mentioned on your stream this week that you'll be playing it, and then you'll play it again and give people a walkthrough. So I'm sure many people are in the same boat. 
but also squadron is often held up at the moment as a we're focusing on squadron you know we're putting all of our resources on squadron and the pu stuff will flow from that after we've got it ready which you know i think has been not universally accepted by the player base oh yeah but i think if you're going to say we're going to put all our all of our resources we're going to really focus on squadron when they do citizen con I want to see it then. Show me what you've been working on. You know, wow me, show me like a little teaser of it. Show me of something that makes me go, oh yeah, Squadron sounds exciting. And I was quite surprised that there was nothing on the agenda for it. Yeah, it's, uh, you make a great point there and it's one that we hear quite often. They are pushing Star Citizen. That's what people are coming to play for. That's what people are throwing their money at. But most of that money seems to be going towards Squadron 42 development, at least first, before Star Citizen. And the fact that they don't communicate with us about Squadron 42 is just not a good look. I mean, they they talked about how they were doing the briefing room back in 2020, which was already five months late from when it was supposed to be. And then they started doing it and they canceled it after one episode. And since then, we really don't get any info. Oh, sorry. We don't get any info on that game. And I, I think... Uh, they can only do that for so long. Well, you would think, but I don't know. And and I, I know they're worried about spoilers, right? You know, yeah. for a story-driven game, and Squadron is supposed to be a story-driven game. You don't want to give too much away. But equally, you know, for me, that's a missed trick for this Citizen Gone. That would have made a great keynote, is we're not going to spoil too much, but we're going to play 20 minutes of a Squadron mission just to show you how things are looking. You know, We told you earlier this year we're spending, I don't know, 90% of our time on Squadron 42. Look at what that has achieved. Get hyped for Squadron for when it comes. Yeah. Um, you know, that for me would have made sense because almost then for the people that are saying, well, you should be working on the Persistent Universe, Star Citizen, not Squadron 42, it almost gives a reason to say, yeah, I know you feel that way, but look at what we've been able to achieve by doing it. By missing it out, you know, it doesn't answer that at all. It doesn't yeah. hype people for Squadron, which I think people should be excited about Squadron. Um, yeah, it just seems like a missed opportunity for me. Yeah, they, um, whether it's the spoilers, which I just don't, by that excuse or they are worried about criticism possibly changing the direction of development again um i don't think that there is any reason to not be sure i mean cyberpunk 2077 is a very story-driven game there are there are a lot of very story-driven games that we get quite a bit of footage and explanation from the developers on well before release a lot of times that's part of marketing that's, you know, six to 12 months before release. And maybe that's what they're waiting for with Squadron. But I don't think that saying just saying that they want to avoid spoilers is a good enough reason to not just show us a firefight in an open area, seeing how maybe AI are reacting or how voice acting is going or how you can be in a, a, a ship piloted by an AI and go down onto the ground and start fighting other people. There are a lot of small little things I think they could show us that wouldn't spoil anything other than, hey, this gun's in the game. Yep, agreed. Agreed completely. You know, you could be careful about it or you could control what you release so that it's in line with what's already been shared. You know, I don't think there'll be, I don't think there'll be very many spoilers from the first mission, for example. It'll probably be, here's your ship, get used to flying it. Right. So, yeah, I, I just think it's a missed opportunity for them. Yeah. At the very least, they could show us another version of the Morrow Tour or of the vertical slice we got in 2017. I think there's a lot of opportunities, but they're just continuing to stay mum about it for whatever reason. I agree. You know, if I could take the Morrow tour in game, it was 2015 they showed us that. If I could do that every single year in game myself, do you know what? I'd be really happy about the state of the Idris. Yeah. Um, but they show us these things and then, you know, we don't see them or they stop showing them to us. But who knows? We're still a week away from CitizenCon. Maybe yeah. that's a big surprise that's waiting. Maybe they'll watch your podcast, Keenan, and say, oh, I should release that. <laughs> so we'll see. They, they, they rushed to get it done in that last week. Um, if you are watching the podcast, please give us some news. Seriously, I think I think there's definitely a a not insignificant amount of people who are either have completely or are slowing down the amount of money that they are willing to put into the project because they just feel like that money is going towards something they can't see and they have no idea what's going on with. That's just that's not good. So, let's move on and talk a little bit about 
3.18. We've been talking about 4.0, CitizenCon, what they're preparing for that. I'd like to discuss the patch that's coming up, hopefully within the next two months. We, we expect to see it in November. That's what they've said, but um, things are still a little shaky as it hasn't gone live yet. Uh, I want to dive into the most interesting topic of the patch, I think, besides persistent entity streaming being the cargo refactor. It's a little, it's a little mysterious. We've had no coverage on it in Inside Star Citizen. We haven't read about it in the monthly reports. It's barely been talked about in Star Citizen Live, yet it has been, I guess, proposed and on the roadmap for more than a year now. Um, what do you think we're actually going to get with the cargo refactor? So I'm probably quite cynical about what I think we'll get on day one. So the, the cargo refactor is part of a much bigger gameplay loop that lets you do all sorts of interesting things with cargo, right? So rather than just, you know, click a button and everything's done, you can manage where your cargo sits on your ship a lot better. You might be able to put cargo in like the hidden compartments of some of the ships that have hidden compartments. For pirates, suddenly you can actually go in and take the cargo and then go off and sell that in your pirate bases or whatever. So the, the big picture system is very interesting. The cynical part of me says a lot of that is very difficult and you need systems in place to allow you to do that. So for example, loading a ship um, my M2 Hercules takes 520 odd boxes. I am not going to sit there and load one box after another 520 times. I've got better things to do with my time. If that's what cargo gameplay looks like, no thanks. So you'd probably want some sort of system that says, actually, you know, you just have a cargo management screen or, you know, you've got ships like the Caterpillar that have tractor beam control stations or, you know, the Constellation Taurus tractor beam. But you need to build systems for that. And the skeptic in me says, I don't think we'll have those in 3.18 because there's a lot of work to do in developing the UI, hooking it all up. Um, so what I expect from 3.18, and I'd love to be wrong about this, I expect an early implementation, which means you can interact with the boxes. So you probably load them in a similar way to what you do now for buying and selling cargo. But once they're in your cargo bay, you can pick them up or you, know, you can move them around with your little tractor beam attachment um that you know means that there's the possibility of piracy but practically it's quite different i think it'd be like xeno threat where moving boxes on scale is a bit of a pain mm -hmm. so i think i think it will be a headline feature and i think it will be a technical marvel right there's a lot of work that goes into making that stuff happen but i think what we'll get in 318 will soon be forgotten by players but will be another building block on the way to getting a more fleshed out finished system but i'd love to be wrong about that i i think you're spot on i think it kind of reminds me it obviously is a bigger deal but it reminds me of when they added um the ability to send money to other players it was like the beginning of a trading system the beginning of our ability to actually interact with other players and it was super necessary because before that we were just doing like beacon workarounds to try and send money to our friends but it also wasn't really something anybody cared about after a patch or two it just kind of melded into the normal game gameplay loop and everybody was just kind of oh well yeah that's part of the game it's just there and I think that's kind of how, yeah, the physicalization is going to be because there's just so much more to come afterward. Yeah, I agree. I think it's reliant on those other systems. So I think we'll see a lot of people playing with it. You know, in the first few weeks of the patch, it'll be interesting. You'll get a lot of pirates that come out of the woodwork that say, oh, this is going to make piracy fun until they realize that tractor beaming 522 boxes from that player's ship to your ship is a bit of a pain. <laughs> I think we'll just go back to what we've got now. So I think, you know, from a technical perspective, it will be good groundwork. I think it opens the door for future systems. And as we get things like, you know, ship-based tractor beams or storage solutions or MPUV cargoes, that little Argo, Argo cargo that could, you know, when all of that stuff starts linking in, it will become more interesting. But for me, this is like the first step. And I don't think we'll see hugely different things. But, you know, maybe maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm too cynical. I would love to be. It's better to be cynical in, in this situation, I think. Do you think this will be another one of those features that they drop in this first version? They say, okay, look, this works. Cargo's physicalized. We don't really need to go much further than that for now. We've got other things to focus on. Or do you think maybe with 4.0 
or even potentially the next patches after that, we'll see some additional work on what would be the overall cargo refactor. I, I think this will be very much as you describe. I think I'm expecting a first drop to say, here's some stuff, play around with it, test it out, we'll build on this later. And then, you know, as as future patches come along, you see more of that. And and to be fair, I think that's what we'll get in 3.18 with the salvage mechanics as well. You know, when they showed off the reclaimer doing its salvage work and it looked awesome until you saw that there was one guy down below decks who was just tractor beaming one box from one place to the other. And pretty much everybody said, I'll do that once. And then, you know, I'm not I'm not going to be stuck below decks moving boxes. So, you know, I think that will be a fun thing to introduce, but then you'll want some sort of systems to be able to pick that up and manage that a bit a bit better. Um, so I think for a lot of these things, it's the initial implementation of the technology gives people a chance to play around with it, but there will need Need to be further development so you don't think we'll see any additional cargo stuff going on with 4.0 uh, maybe we will um i think if if 318 goes well and goes the way that i expect it to which is you know here's your basic cargo management you can move the boxes around if you want to but other otherwise gameplay looks like it always did that opens the avenue for 4.0 to bring more interesting things online like um how you stack your ship how you interact with vendors and people who actually move boxes for you or systems that move boxes for you um but i think that will depend on what we get in 318 so i think it's possible okay that's fair so cargo refactor is a big one uh, but obviously the biggest feature coming in that patch is persistent entity streaming. Now we've recently heard that that update to, or rather that piece of tech isn't necessarily as major as people were expecting just because it's missing a couple of the small components that will likely come in later. Um, but it is still going to have an impact on the game. Now, what kind of benefits from it being included in the game are you, are you thinking we'll see with 3.18? Personally, I don't think we'll see much. Um, for me, it's a much more interesting back-end technology, and it's the culmination of all of those back-end technologies coming together that makes for interesting, immersive gameplay. I, I don't think it's going to radically change my gameplay experience in 3.18. Um, that said, I, I recognize that it's another really important technical milestone. It's another hurdle that the team need to address to be able to deliver stuff that I will be interested in and in seeing in-game. Um, but again, maybe I'm being skeptical. I feel like I've been, I've been too much of a downer on this podcast, but I, I'm not sure that I'll see any real changes in what I do day-to-day -day in Star Citizen in 3.18. Okay. Moving on to locations that they're adding into this new patch. One of the, so they're doing derelicts, um, a, a new set of derelicts, but they're also adding some new caves. And these are a new cave archetype. It's, it's the cave development has been very interesting. It's been kind of like uh, scattered. I think they they added caves and then like they threw in this small update that only introduced new entrances to the caves. And now they're giving us sand caves, which is like a new archetype of cave, but they're not giving us any gameplay. Do you think that it's a good idea for them to be pushing out a new location without new content with it? Because it feels like we've started to get used to with the new derelict reclaimers and all these new derelict ships and new derelict outposts and just different locations have started to have missions and things involved with them. But this sounds very bare bones. What do you think of that? I think that's okay. Um, I think new places to explore for, for some players will always be worth doing, right? You, you, just the fact that it's there and I can visit it is worth doing it. Um, and I think I, I my reflection on this was I remember when they first introduced the various bunkers into the game, right? And when they first introduced them, you went down an elevator, you walked around them, and there was nothing there. Now, actually, one of the key activities that people do is the bunkers sometimes have missions, and there are bad guys in there, and you go and shoot them. And if you watch content creators, you know they spend a lot of their time going into those bunkers that initially had nothing to do with them. And now they're quite interesting content areas. So I think the caves could be similar. You know, I wouldn't be surprised if it starts by just being some padding, somewhere else to go and view, but not much going with it to actually becoming more useful locations in the verse later on and i'm i'm okay with that yeah that's i i think i lean both ways on it um because i i think it's a very crucial idea that they're including content with locations but 
you know, if if it is something that is worthy of exploration, whether they're putting loot down there or just something that you can find, that's that is at least something. And you mentioned empty locations being added with content added later. And I can think of two pretty glaring examples where that hasn't quite happened yet. One of them being the cargo decks, but the other being Grim Hex and the um, racing area over in Grim Hex. They never really added races to that, but we do see them focusing more on races coming up with 318 with the PTV racetrack going on and with, uh, I think it was another another edition of races. Was it just the PTV racetrack? Yeah, I think that's it. But, but that, along with the snake pit that they did recently, shows that they're kind of starting to focus on racing again. Um, what do you, are, are you, are you interested at all in racing? Do you think that that's something that is crucial to the game right now? I know there's a lot of the community focused on it, but what's your take? Um, personally, I'm not big into it. And this is where I would agree with Avenger one in his assessment of me. I'm not big into it cause I'm not good at it. <laughs> I've never been particularly <laughs> good at, at racing Sims and things like that. I just can't ever get the full optimization, but I, you know, I enjoy it. Um, I think there is a large, well, I, I wouldn't necessarily say large, but there is definitely a dedicated community in Star Citizen around racing, and I think that's great. Um, you know, not not everybody in the game has to sample every part of it, and you know, not everybody has to be a, a, the best racer. But right. we do have ships that are dedicated to racing, um, and Star Citizen has always been more than just ships fighting each other. So I, I like racing being in the game and being around. And I actually quite like it being developed a little bit more, fleshed out a little bit more, more places, because in the nicest possible way, I see that as a quick win. These are all systems that are already in the game. You can drive a PTV in the game. You can fly your ships in the game. So just by giving a little bit of structure, actually it opens up huge avenues for that dedicated racing community with very little effort on the part of the developers, which I think is fantastic. More and more of that where you can add gameplay with minimal effort for me it sounds just fantastic that's a good point it it adds another thing to the list of of stuff that newcomers can come in and try you can look at the game that is star citizen and while many people will talk about it being you know no content they're not making any progress like there's nothing really to do every new kind of career or profession that they add like racing is just another thing that maybe you could say hey you know if you're interested in space racing it's there now Absolutely. And that's what's exciting about Star Citizen. You know, it, it is it is what you make of it. It's not just a combat game. It's not just a PvE game. It's not just a PvP game. You know, you've got all of these different angles, all of these different parts. And it's about, you know, the more of those that you can get online. And, and I think the more of those you can get online for the least effort means that you can have more and more in the game on offer to people. It just makes the place more interesting. Um, I'm not going to be big into PTV racing, right? It's not something I'm going to do every weekend. I can tell you that now. <laughs> yeah. But I will do it. I will try it out and I'll give it a go and I'll give it a bash. And it might be something that I do a few times a year just as a bit of fun. Um, and I, I, I like things like that. I wonder if they look at things like the Daymar Rally and realize like if we if we improve the situation for them, we can really capitalize on that because you're starting to see. I know Red Bull Gaming just put out a video where they were looking at the racing aspects of the game. And um, the Daymar Rally obviously is like the biggest Star Citizen event, so big that they've actually included it in the official lore. And I wonder how much that kind of stuff, seeing that drives their focus on the profession. Yeah, and and that for me is a great example where if you if you give people just the base, most basic of tools, that's true emergent gameplay. And credit to the, all of the team that have kind of worked on or participated in the Daymar yeah. Rally. That is the tip-top example of, you know, they didn't get much. <laughs> there wasn't a huge amount of in-game kind of support at the start, but they made it work and they made it happen and people, you know, attend that and join that. And everybody plays their part, you know, whether it's people running the vehicle crews or people helping to run security or people helping with the recording and, you know, showcasing what people are doing. And that for me is fantastic. So, yeah. Yeah. Shout out to the Atmo Esports team. Um, Corsair over there has put together a great team and they've they have been dedicated and determined and they've made it work, I think, for four years now running. Uh, it's been very incredible to see how it's grown and succeeded. Now, the last thing I wanted to talk about with 318 was some new mission content, which we don't we don't 
we didn't see too often before this year, but now we're really starting to get consistent new missions. Um, they're adding some new missions to the platforms that are orbiting in low orbit over Crusader, the gas giant. And uh, these are essentially the same thing as what was in Siege of Orison, repurposed for different types of missions. Now, we're seeing new outposts. We're seeing building interiors worked on for places like R Corp. We're seeing the Lorville rework. Um, do you think that we're going to start seeing more missions maybe taking place in cities? Because right now there's not much reason to go to landing zones and people tend to hate them. <laughs> I, I think it's certainly possible. And I think we're seeing more of that. I, I don't know how much of that is driven by a desire to get people into cities per se, versus just the fact that we've got so many other missions that are taking place in quite a small area on Stanton that you can't just keep adding missions that take you to the same places mm -hmm. um because you know especially with 100 player servers now you increase the chance that someone else turns up to do the a different mission in the same place and that's not a great experience when you've been sent after you know your sixth bounty hunter of the day and you know there's other people around so it might just be a case of just balancing where the population goes i'd i'd love to see more social reasons to visit places like cities so i'd like to see you know more reasons that you might go to somewhere like that just to hang out with friends or you know just to chill out or do something a little bit different that's what i quite liked about the idea of the ptv racing as a reason to go somewhere like a city um you know, you just go there and you just hang out with your friends. You know, if you had other things on offer, and I'm just spitballing here, right? But, you know, things like if you could do, I don't know, in-game bowling with the in-game physics or, you know, I don't know, using a little, those little dart guns that you get, those little, they're not Nerf guns, but you know what I mean? And just doing some laser tag or something like that in one of the cities. Just some social type reasons to go. That would be much more interesting to me than, you know, the Siege of Orison type stuff. But maybe that's yeah. just me. I would I would love to see, and I can't believe we still haven't seen um, uh, firing ranges at the stores that sell weapons, where you can just kick back with some friends and test out the guns back there and see what they're like. Uh, I, I agree with you yeah. that little reasons to go to the cities would be great, not not just missions, but when you're doing your cargo delivery and you know with the new kiosk timers come in and you got 20 minutes until your ship is filled up maybe you want to go off and do something else in the city while you're there and it would be nice to have more interactive stuff going on in the cities and the bars and, and stuff like that i agree absolutely agree with that and I, I guess for the reassurance of the viewers i am not saying spend months and months and months developing <laughs> this stuff instead of pushing forward oh, no. the game I'm saying, you know, find those quick wins that are like one or two days worth of work that use the existing systems that we've got in game just to make something fun. That's what I like about the PTV racing. It's not redeveloping ground vehicles. It's literally, oh, I had some spare time. So as a joke, I made a racetrack and turns out it was quite fun. Um, you know, that sort of thing is a quick win, but great to include in the game. Somebody's going to quote you. You're going to see a, a, a post on Reddit. Ferrister calling for uh, two quarters of development on bowling alleys in our corp cancel them <laughs> the game's not done no bowling I, I i'm in full agreement with you though they've got plenty of tools and features that are like at least kind of working now that they could probably repurpose into a couple extra things that we could do here and there but you know that's there are a lot of opinions on that i'm sure yeah, and, and for me, those things would be more compelling reasons to visit cities. Everybody turned up at Microtech or Crusader when there was the IAE on because they wanted to look around the ships, look through the expo halls. That sort of stuff is, for me, that's a, an easy ticket to just, oh, the expo isn't on, so we've used the expo hall for a racetrack or for a shooting range or, you know, in-game chess using the MSR chess board if you're really into that. You know, that sort of stuff is a much better use of minimal effort you know, for a decent output. Yeah. Well, to wrap things up, I know I said that was going to be last, last question, but to wrap things up, what are you most excited for in 3.18? I think I'm most excited for the potential it has for future patches. I think if we see things like the cargo refactor, things like PES introduced and having a minimal impact to the game 
confusingly, I think that's a good thing because I think that means that those things are working as intended and are crucial building blocks for the future. So what would excite me most for 3.18 is if we saw a stable patch where you couldn't really tell that things have changed that much, but that you know that the backend stuff is all on this new tech that they need introduced for future features. Which is kind of ex exactly how they've uh, structured our expectations for PES in the last few weeks. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I, I hope that 3.18 was a, is a stable patch. After so long and being on 3.17 and with so much kind of, I don't want to say hype, but like anticipation for 3.18, it would be great if it was a stable patch leading into what is essentially a journey to 4.0 and, and probably a very intense crunch time. For, well, I don't want to say crunch time because that has bad connotations, but a, a very intense period of development, we'll say, leading up to 4.0 and obviously anticipation from the community. Um, thank you, Ferrister, for joining me for this talk. I'm, I, this was great, honestly. I can't believe that was an hour already. Um, but this was a really good look at CitizenCon 318 and a little bit of 4.0, actually, we snuck in there. Is there anything that you'd like to leave off on that you wanted to mention or discuss that we might have missed? Just that, you know, I'm definitely not a downer about the project for Star Citizen. I'm, I'm really excited about Star Citizen. I play Star Citizen a lot, but I also think, you know, we're at the stage now where all of the big things need little things to happen behind the scenes um, first before we can see them. So things like 318, it doesn't sound like I'm excited for it but I'm more excited for what that means about you know, these technical hurdles that they've solved. And likewise for CitizenCon, I'm really excited to watch CitizenCon. I'll watch every panel, um, but I'm not expecting it to change the world for me. Um, I think it will be more of an interesting thing. So I'm, I'm very excited about Star Citizen, looking forward to some of the things that we'll get. I just want to temper my expectations so I'm not overbuilding the hype and setting unrealistic expectations. Right. What you're hearing in Ferrister is not doubt or being a downer per se. It's just past trauma. <laughs> it's it's <laughs> following the game for a while and understanding that while things may sound amazing, generally they're just a stepping stone. Um, could you do me a quick favor and the, and the good listeners of the podcast a quick favor? Uh, let everybody know where they might find your content and see the stuff that you've been producing on Star Citizen. Sure. So um, you'll find my videos on YouTube if you go to youtube.com forward slash Farrister. Um, on there, I have lots of different videos ranging from ship reviews. I do location spotlights where I celebrate some of the work put into the different places in Star Citizen. And I'm also throwing in some more around just what Star Citizen gameplay looks like with some commentary overlaid. You'll also often find me um, watching the various content creators and streamers around the verse. Um, my personal circumstances are such now that um, I spend probably as much time watching other people play the game as I do playing it myself. Um, but yeah, probably youtube.com forward slash Farrister or on Twitter as well at Thomas Farrister. Cool. I always appreciate seeing you hop into chat because um, you've always got good things to say, good feedback, and we have good conversations when I, when I can. Streaming's kind of hectic with chat and everything, but... Thank you for that. You know, I I hope that I can also start hopping into people's chats more and interacting with the rest of the community. Anyways, uh, thank you everybody else for coming to this episode, whether you're watching on YouTube or listening on any of the, the podcast platforms, whichever one you may like. Uh, we do this every week. Different guests, different features, sometimes multiple guests. We talk about Star Citizen, how it relates to other games and how it uh, is still in development. But it's always a good time, always a good chat. Ferrister, I appreciate you coming along for this one. And supporters who get to watch this live right here in Discord, thank you all for coming to the live show. If you'd like to get to check this one out live or see my exclusive videos I put out every year, or every year, every month, check out the links in the description or check me out on patreon.com slash space tomato. I'd like to thank you all for coming, Ferrister, you especially. And I'll see you all next week. <laughs>